Okay, so here we are at the lathe and we're going to be doing the first part of the demonstration for the threaded shaft project. So at this point, I have already cut this uh, piece of stock and it is, let's see, that's one inch, whoop, one inch in diameter and it's about yeah, four and an eighth of an inch long, so that all looks good. I'm gonna put that to the side for a moment. I also have all of the tools and uh, documents that I need in order to make this part. So I've got my print right here, and I'm actually gonna flip it over to the page that I need. So we already looked at this once before, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and put that on the binder clip or the print clip behind the machine on the backsplash so that I always have it on hand. Uh, and then I've also got the project planning worksheet right there. So that's on my cart and I've got all the tools I already need. I've got my drill chuck, my live center. Um, I've got my center drill. I've got my tools. I've got a micrometer. I've got a dial caliper. I've got all that good stuff that you'll see here in a moment. Uh, and so I'm pretty much ready to go. There are just a couple of quick checks that I want to do on the machine itself. So uh, one is that I want to make sure that I've got the correct chuck on here. So this right here is a three jaw chuck. So that's the right one. Um, and I really want to make sure that it is tightened the correct way. So remember these cam locks that fasten the, the chuck to the actual spindle nose. Uh, those really want to be, what would you call it? Righty tighty lefty loosey. All right, sometimes people would tighten them to the left instead of to the right. Let me see if I can mosey on over there. So sometimes people uh, will tighten these to the left rather than to the right. Okay, so right here, there's a little chisel mark. That chisel mark really has to be between the two carrots, right, when it's tight. Um, and then when you want to loosen it, then you back it out to the left so that the two chisel marks here, the one on the spindle nose and the one on the cam lock actually line up. You do that to all of them and you can pop this loose off of the taper. Uh, but when it's tight, you really need to make sure that they're between the carrots because you could actually tighten them all the way to the left um, and that might look kind of like it's tight and it might uh, stay put on the spindle nose for a limited time, but eventually it will come rattling loose and then the chuck will fly off. So that's something I always make sure to check. Another thing that I check along the same lines here is um, to make sure that these hardened jaws are firmly attached to the master jaws that actually ride in the scroll on the three jaw chuck. And so I just take the correct size Allen wrench, put this thing into uh, low, maybe put my foot on the brake. Just make sure that they're all tight, kind of all the way around. That's another thing I don't want flying off at some inopportune moment, you know what I'm saying? Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so at this point, um, I'm going to install the part. This is uh, step two. Install the three jaw chuck in the lathe, mount part in chuck with one inch stick out. Just like that. Um, and I want, it said one inch stick out, just like that. So you just go ahead and put the ruler uh, on the end of the jaw, you know, move your part so it's about one inch out. It doesn't have to be super precise. And then I'm going to go ahead and tighten this down with the chuck wrench. Make sure that you don't just leave that chuck wrench in there, right? One hand on the chuck wrench at all times. And if you have to take both hands off, just go ahead and remove the chuck wrench. Okay. Next thing is that we need to set the tool heights of our tools. Um, and so we're going to be using a, let's see, this is the left-handed tool. We're going to be using that one. And we're also going to be using the right-hand tool, this one. And so both of those need to uh, be set into tool holders and need to have their heights adjusted. So just going to grab one of these tool holders right here. Okay, and the tool, let's see, the tool goes in there like that. This is a left-handed tool, goes in there like that. Um, and then what you can do is you're going to dog down the tool with the set screws. And you really need at least two of these. You only need at least two of these. 
Because if it's just one, right, then it can create a pivot point. Let me show you. If you only have one tight, then it's like a, a pivot point. Right? And we don't want that. Right? We want it firmly affixed. And so we need at least two points here, two set screws. And you can do more just for you know, extra, extra tightness there. Actually, this one where, uh, you know, I have to take that back. We're going to have to remove that one and flip it back around just because of the orientation of the lathe. But for now, this is perfectly fine. Now, you can see that the, um, the, the dovetail on the tool holder fits on the dovetail in the tool post here. You know, make sure that this is open. Drop that down and then lock it. And uh, what we're really going to be doing is we're going to uh, we're going to be adjusting this nut right here to move the tool up and down. Basically, where the tool sits is dependent on where the bottom of this nut bottoms out on the top of the tool post. And so uh, that's what we're going to be adjusting. But the question is, how do you actually set the tool height? Okay? I'll show you in a moment uh, that you can actually do a pretty sensitive test by t just by taking a cut and seeing where the, uh, the nub is. So the thing that I use actually is a live center. And I'll just go ahead and put it right up into the tailstock, like so. And uh, if the tailstock was correctly manufactured uh, and it's in uh, reasonably good alignment, which it probably is, uh, then the tip of that live center should be right on the center of the spindle axis, right? Because actually, we're going to use this as a fixed string tool. We're going to pinch our part between the two, um, between a center here in the chuck and this center. Right? So if they're askew at all, then our part's not going to be turning on that true center axis. And so this really should be perfectly on center. So we can actually just adjust this up and down so that the tip of the tool meets up with that tip of the center. So let me go ahead and stick this out a little bit further. It'll be a little bit easier for you to see what's going on. Something like that, right? Okay. So I'm going to loosen this, and I can actually just lift this up you're not going to get a really great vantage point from the angle of the camera right now, but you can just trust me that I'm lifting this up in order to get that tool point level up and down with that point on the end of the center. And then I'm just going to lock down this jam nut, right? Just makes, just makes it so that this little knurled nut can't back off quite as easy. Okay, so that's good. And actually, I need to turn this back around because the left-hand tool is going to be facing out this way when all is said and done. And I'll show you that in just a moment. All right. There we go. Okay, now it's time to do the other one. So the nice thing about these quick change tool posts is that you can set one tool, take the tool holder out, and then oh, put another one in, and then come back to the original one. It'll repeat in its position. They say within two thousandths of an inch, which is awfully good, I think. I'll just grab another one. Okay, so this one is going to be for the right hand cutting tool. Let me go ahead and open that up a bit. Okay, uh, you know, it's going to be really the same thing. I really like these T-handle Allen wrenches, but they do tend to interfere a little bit with the tool post, which is kind of annoying. I'm going to get ones that are just a little bit longer. Oh. Okay, let's try this again. All right, so this one is definitely too high. I don't know if you can see that, but it's definitely too high. Let's stick it out a little bit more so you can see it like so. Okay, so I'm going to open this up. I'm going to back the jam nut off. These threads are pretty mangled. All right, drop that down a bit. Back that nut off. There we go. That's pretty close. Uh, yeah, maybe just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. I'm kind of like getting down so that my, my eye is right level with the end of the center. And that looks pretty good to me. Okay. Now this one's actually going to be mounted in this position. So I'm going to readjust this. 
back this off a little bit. Okay, and just lock it down like so. Okay, good. That's both of the tools right there. At least the ones that we need for this stage. Okay, now the next thing that I need to do, right, is basically just um, figure out exactly how I want to orient this compound uh, and how I want to orient the tool rest, okay? So first, the compound, all right, this can be set really at any angle. It, it's not super critical. Um, just for clearance issues, uh, we typically have the compound anywhere from 90, so let's say 90 degrees perpendicular to the spindle axis, or maybe even you know, parallel with the spindle axis like that, somewhere in between. We usually don't you know, have it angled this way or that way unless it's really necessary. Okay, but anywhere in here is fine. The only issue is, well, if it's perfectly parallel, then the tailstock or whatever's in the tailstock can interfere with the compound and with this dial here. And then if you're exactly perpendicular to the spindle axis, uh, then these two dials, and you can't really see that there. There's a dial here at the end. So the cross slide dial and the compound dial right here, they can intersect, right? And so you're trying to move them and your hands are getting all all over the place, so that's not good. So I'm just gonna set it, I don't know, arbitrarily, I don't know, 45 degrees, whatever. I'm gonna set that at zero just to have a little starting position right there. Maybe like that, 45 degrees, about. It's not super important. There are degree markings here on the side, so there's a little chisel mark there and a little chisel mark there, and then degree markings on the side of the compound that you can use to set it at exactly the angle that you want, but at this stage of the game, it's not necessary to do so. All right, now what we need to do is we need to change the angle of the tool post, because the angle of the tool post is gonna determine um, the angle uh, of our cutting edges, right? So, you know, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and just put in one of the tool holders, lock it in like that, and then there are a number of ways to actually set this up so that it's nice and square to the rest of the machine. One is that you can just kind of pick like a, a, a straight reference, like the side of the cross slide like this, and just kind of line up by eye the tool holder or some other line that's actually on the tool holder or the tool post or tool holder or tool itself or whatever it is, just line it up by eye and then lock this down, okay? And that's usually good enough, just a little visual reference. But an even better way to do this, is actually, again, to use the tailstock. Because the end of the tailstock, right here, is a pretty gosh darn square to the rest of the machine. So just bring it up and touch it up against the back of the tool post right there. That'll go pretty far to getting a square. Something like that. So you can see that you can orient it in a number of different ways, but I'm just gonna kind of push it up against the tailstock like that at the end of the quill, and then lock it down. Okay, that seems pretty good to me. Okay. Now this one's actually the left hand tool, so that actually gets mounted like that. Pretty good. So next step, number four, is we're actually gonna take a cut. We're gonna uh, face side number one to clean. And um, normally at this point I would ask people, what speed am I supposed to run this? Um, but you know that's something that I kind of expect you to do uh, on your own, and I don't wanna give the answer away in case we haven't met since uh, we did the uh, lecture video for this. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it to what it is, and. you're gonna to have to figure it out. Okay, so there we go. I might mess up and actually say what it is, but that would be an accident. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on. Okay, so I'm gonna bring the tool in just to touch, right? So I'm moving it to the left, you know, my left. I guess it's your left too in this vantage point. But I'm moving the carriage to the left by turning this handle counterclockwise, and I moved it just enough so that my tool actually touched the spinning part. So this is called a dynamic touch-off. 
where the part being just bandsaw cut on its end is going to, I mean, you can see pretty clearly that it's wobbling around quite a bit. And so we spin it up like this and then touch off on it so that we make sure that we touch off on the furthest, uh, the, the part of the surface that's sticking out furthest from the end of the chuck. Um, and you can see that in terms of my cross slide position, I'm just f far enough in so that when I move the tool to the left, I'll actually touch that diameter. Okay, now I'm gonna pull that back, turn it off. Now I have this little, um, it's called a dial indicator, and it's just got a little plunger on it. And when you move the plunger in and out, it moves that little needle and tells you how much you're moving in increments of thousands of an inch. And actually, it can make 10 revolutions, so that's one inch total, 10 times 100 thousandths of an inch. It's got a little magnetic back on it. And just stick that right onto the way surface right there. Oop, came undone. Stick it right onto the way surface, bump it up against the carriage so that you preload it a little bit. You can move the dial face so that the needle lines up with the zero. Okay, and now I'm gonna take some minimal value off of the uh, face of the part, and so maybe I'll just go in 10 thousandths or so, or maybe I'll go in 20 thousandths and see what we get. Okay, I'm gonna turn it on. Now I wanna set this thing so that the cross feed feeds across the face. Okay. So I'm gonna push this in to get my cross feed and I'll test it out which direction it's going. That's not the right direction. So I'm gonna pull the plunger out, then re-engage it. That is the correct direction, but it's feeding awfully slowly. So I'm gonna go like seven thousandths of an inch for uh, roughing out. So LCS8W is what it says here on the side. So that's LCS8W. Okay, and so now I should have a faster feed rate. That looks pretty good. Okay, give it a little bit of coolant and feed across the face. Just until we get to the center there. Nothing too exciting. Okay, once we've gone past center, there's no need to keep cutting. So I'm just gonna back it off. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna kind of check to see what the center of the part looks like. And actually right now it's perfect in the sense that right there at the center, it's totally flat across the center. Now, if there were like a little bit of a nub there, then it would be indicative uh, of a tool height center which was not at the correct position. Um, and there's a little bit of a, I won't say really like a science to this, but you can tell by the type of nub that you have whether you're too high or too low. So let's, let's think about this for a second, okay? So these are the two conditions, right? Here's the part. We can have a little sharp nub like that that really just kind of looks like a, a very, very, very small cylinder protruding from the end of the part. Or we could have something that looks like this. A little rounded off nub, that's a terrible drawing, but I think you get the point, a little rounded off nub, okay? So in this case, our tool, this is the tool, the tool's just a little bit too low, meaning that it didn't, when it went close to the center, it didn't even cut that center area, and so it just left a little cylinder there, okay? So this is too low, and you need to raise the height a little bit. But in this case, with a little rounded off nub, our part, or sorry, our tool, is too high. It's too high, right? Because actually, when we got past the center, or close to the center, uh, we actually started rubbing the material off underneath the cutting edge, and that's why it got all rounded off like that, okay? So actually, this is a pretty sensitive test. If you machine it, and it comes off looking like that with no nub whatsoever, then you know that you went exactly to the center point And um, there we go, perfect, ooh, terrible, very difficult to write this way. Anyway, but here when you're perfectly on center, then you'll have no nub whatsoever. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. And here, it looks real good, so I'm happy. So now that we've cleaned this side up, uh, step number five is to center drill it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove the tool for this. Get this out of the way. 
Okay. I'm going to uh, install the drill chuck. I'm just going to use this little um, keyless drill chuck. It's just a little bit more convenient to use, although I think I mentioned in the lecture that it's not actually the most accurate thing to use, but it'll work very well for our purposes. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, install the center. The center drill, not the center, sorry, the center drill is a number three center drill. It's just a specific size. They come in different sizes. Um, and I'm going to bump this up pretty close to the part, and then I'm going to lock it down, meaning locking the tailstock down, but still leaving the quill unlocked so that I can drill with it. I'm going to go ahead and change the RPM. There we go. Oh, turn it on. Okay. Give it a little bit of coolant. Now I'm going to feed in just so it goes part way up that cone. Actually, the bigger the cone, the better, but don't cut into that cylindrical section of the live center, or of the uh, center drill, sorry. So that looks pretty good, actually. Don't know if you can see that. It's kind of hard to see from this angle. But right in there, let me go ahead and turn that off. I always turn the emergency uh, stop on so that I don't accidentally hit the on lever and uh, start this with my fleshy little finger so close to the chuck. Anyway, so that looks pretty good. Just a little bit of a cone there on the outside. And uh, that's really all we need to do. So at this point, I can go ahead and remove the part, and we're going to flip it around. That's uh, step number six. And this time, I'm going to have, how much am I sticking out? An inch and a half. Inch and a half of stick out, something like that. And tighten that down. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and put that left hand tool back in there. And we're going to cut this side. So just face it to clean. OK, so I'm just a little bit, you know, I'm far enough in on the cross slide so that when I move it to the left, I'll be touching that surface. Dynamic touch off again. There we go. Boom, touch off. Back it up a little bit. You can see this side is actually, uh, it came from the mill, so it was actually sheared off on the end, and so it's really oblong. It's not a great shape. Okay, going to go ahead and set up the dial indicator. Whoop. Right there. Zero it out. Okay. Now I'm going to move this out, let's say, 20 thousandths and see if it cleans up. A little bit of coolant. You should really use any time you're machining with high-speed steel, especially if the workpiece material is like uh, steel or anything harder than that, you really should use a little bit of coolant. So just taking a little cut across the face. Looks like it's cleaning up pretty well. I might have to go a little bit further. Okay, I'm past the center. I'm going to pull it back. Turn the e-stop on. Yeah, okay. It didn't clean up all the way, but it cleaned up enough that I can take a measurement. Okay? So at this point, what I'm going to do is go ahead and take this out and take a measurement. It's just a, just a little bit dirty, so I'm going to wipe that off. Okay, so I'm going to use a dial caliper to check this. Just like any other tool, you really need to zero set that dial caliper. Okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, open it up, see what we've got. From end to end, that says, I'm sorry, you might not be able to see that. From end to end, that says four inches and let's say 80 thousandths. Four inches and 80 thousandths. 4.080. Okay, great. So in order to get this down to 4 inches, I have to take off 80 thousandths. So here's how we're going to do that. I'm going to put this back into the chuck, again with that inch and a half stick out.
here's the deal with this stick out business, okay? Whenever you're machining, there's always a battle between clearance and rigidity, right? We need this part to stick out far enough so that we can access all of the material that we need to cut off. But if we stick it out too far, then we're only going to be holding on to a little bit of it. And all of this, you know, this is an inherently um, unstable kind of support here because it's only held on one side. And then everything over here is just cantilevered off of that one support, right? So the further out you stick it, the more unsupported it is. And so you can easily run into deflection or vibration or all kinds of other nasties, right? So it's, it's, you find a minimum distance that you need to stick it out while still getting enough clearance. Okay. So let me go ahead and try to avoid cleaning off these chips with your hands, okay? Just use something like a brush and it's not that hard to do. Okay, so everything's nice and tight. Turn this back on. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and touch off very, very, very gently so that I don't take off too much material when I touch the surface just until I actually snag a chip off of there. Just until I snag a chip. Just until I snag a chip. There we go. Just the tiniest little chip that I shaved off of there. Okay. Now I'm going to reset my dial indicator because it will have moved when I took the part out, right? It's not going to be sitting exactly in the same place, right? So I need to retouch off and re-zero my dial indicator. But now I refound my position. And I knew that I had to go 80 thousandths in order to get down to four inches. So let's say maximum cut of 50 thousandths, 0.050. So I'm going to go over 50, take the cut, there we go, nice and slow. There we go. Okay, I get to the center. Move it away so I don't drag the tool too much. Bring it back to the start. And then go another 30 thousandths of an inch past where I was before. So I was at from zero to 50 thousandths. So now I'm going to go another 30 thousandths to the 80. So there we go. It's cutting very, very nicely. Like I said, this 12L14 leaded steel just machines like a hot knife through butter on a summer's day right there okay now back it off we'll go ahead and remove the dial indicator stop the machine clean off that tool and remove the tool okay so at this point, I'm going to center drill that second side. Okay, bump it up close to the surface, lock it, turn the RPM up. Okay, give it a little coolant, and away we go. Okay, not all the way up so that I cut on the straight portion of the center drill just to put a little cone on there. And that looks pretty good to me. You can kind of see it if I move the camera out a little bit, just right there. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead and install the right hand cutting tool because now we're going to turn down this diameter, turn down this diameter to 875, 875. Okay, so in order to do that, we have to talk a little bit more about uh, something called backlash, right? It's something that we have to remember uh, to account for when we're trying to turn very, uh, you know, tight tolerance diameters. But before we get into that, 
what I need to do is make sure that I have enough clearance here so that I can feed all the way to the end of the diameter without slamming into the lathe chuck. So I'm just gonna go ahead and mark. It says that I need to cut about an inch and a quarter back from the end of the part. So that's about right there. Just with a ruler, you know. Now I'm gonna go ahead and move the tool so that the cutting edge lines up with that mark. And then I'm gonna do what's called a spin test. I'm gonna put it in neutral and do a spin test, okay? So, technically I can spin this without slamming into the tool holder or the bottom of the cross slide or the side of the tool, and that's good. So technically this is okay. The only problem really is that it's a little close for comfort. So I can do one of two things. Either I can stick the, two, or, uh, stick the part out a little bit further, or alternatively, the tool is just a little bit far back in the tool holder. And so I can just stick it out a little bit so it's more flush with the side, and that'll give me a little bit more room, just to make me feel a little bit more comfortable. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. All right, can you just bump this out a little bit just so it's nice and flush, try and keep it square to the side of the tool holder. Okay, now let's double check where we are. Okay, so that's where we're gonna stop. And yeah, that bought us a little bit of space and I feel okay with that. Okay. Okay, let me set it back up for the right speed. And we're gonna start this up. Whoop. Start this up. Okay, now, instead of being in front of the end of the part and moving to the left to touch off, now I'm gonna move to the left in order to be on top of that diameter and then move in with the cross slide just until I touch. And you can see that that part is running out just a little bit, right? It's not perfectly center in the spindle, right? And so actually it's not cutting everywhere, right? I'm actually only touching the, the part of the diameter that's sticking out the furthest, so that's okay, okay? Now I'm going to hold the dial right here so it doesn't move, and then I am going to rotate this little knurled ring to adjust the scale on the dial so that the zero lines up with the little chisel mark right there. And uh, these values in here, each graduation is one thousandth of an inch. It says it right there. And so that's what I'm looking for, okay? I'm gonna be going in a certain number of thousandths of an inch. Actually, you know, I'm having just a little bit of trouble seeing that Sharpie mark. So a couple of things that you can do to make the Sharpie mark a little bit more visible is that uh, you can go ahead and put this into a very, very, very slow speed. Like that right there is the slowest that it'll go. Then you put the Sharpie in the place where you see that Sharpie mark and you just make like a whole ring there. If you make a nice little line, it's gonna be a lot easier to see when this thing is spinning. The other thing that you can do that I actually really like doing, I'm gonna back this up a little bit. So reposition the tool so it's right above that Sharpie mark. And then turn the spindle on. And then just feed it in until you actually scribe a little line right there. And that's usually a pretty good way to tell where you are. I don't know, two different ways to do something. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and touch off again. Just make sure that I'm back at my zero. There we go. I moved off my zero just a little bit. All right, so now, you know, this should be one inch, okay? That stock is about one inch, and I'm going down to 875 thousandths. So because this is a rough stock surface, and because we know that it's running out in the spindle a little bit, um, what I need to do is take a little bit of a cut on there to establish a true diameter and know exactly what that diameter is so that I can link up 
the position on my dial with the size of the diameter that I'm cutting, right? So I'm just gonna go in 20 thousandths, 20 of these little graduations to the 0 0.02, and I'm gonna take a little cut. I'm gonna set this up so that I cut on the longitudinal feed. Test this out, nope, it's feeding the wrong way, so I'm gonna push this back in. And I have this still set up at 7 thousandths per revolution. Um, so that means that every time this uh, part makes one full 360 degree rotation, the tool is going to feed to the left seven thousandths of an inch, right? So that tells you, and I think I showed you before when we did our little walkthrough on the lathe, that the, the quick change gearbox is fed directly off of the spindle. So if the spindle spins faster, this is also going to feed faster, but only because it's always keeping the same ratio between revolutions and inches per revolution that this thing feeds, if that makes sense. Okay, so this is gonna be a 20 thousandths cut. Give it a little culent, and away we go. And it looks like it's cleaning up everywhere for the most part. We just need to get a good diameter to measure off of. And I always keep my hand firmly on that feed lever so that I'm not looking for it when I need it, right there. Okay, I'm going to back this up one full revolution just to get it out of the way and then back the tool off, turn this off, hit the e-stop and then I can clean this up. It looks like we got a good diameter there and so now I'm going to measure it. Okay, so I'm going to use the dial calipers again because uh, I'm just roughing, okay? So when I get a little bit closer, I'm going to use the micrometer uh, because the dial calipers really are only good to like, I don't know, within, well, it depends on the quality and the care and maintenance of the dial caliper, but I certainly wouldn't trust this for anything closer than 10 thousandths. But for roughing, we can get pretty close here, and this is telling me 970 thousandths, okay? And we're shooting for 875, so I have another 95 thousandths to go, 0 0.095. So I'm going to rough this out a little bit closer and get it all the way down to uh, 30 thousandths of an inch over my final size, which is 875. So that's going to be 905 thousandths of an inch. So to go from 970 to 905, I have to take a cut of 65 thousandths. Okay, now we have to talk about backlash, okay? So, I'm gonna go back in my one revolution that I back this thing out. So I'm still at 0.02, okay? Now I'm gonna go in another 65 thousandths, that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 65. All right, so far so good, but what if I accidentally overshoot a little bit? I went five thousandths too far. Can I just back the dial up that five thousandths and be good? Unfortunately not, because of backlash. Let me explain. Okay, so let's demonstrate on this little screw and nut combo right here. This is actually the same type of screw thread that you'll find in the cross slide. The way that this actually works is that the, when you turn the handle on the cross slide, it actually turns a screw that runs the length of the entire cross slide here, right? And then affixed to the top of this slide itself uh, it's actually underneath the slide, it's actually right where these uh, nuts are right here, is a little nut. And so when you turn the screw, the nut is captured, and so that forces the whole cross slide to follow the threads on the dial. It's called a lead screw, okay? And um, so just because there's a specific relationship between how far the cross slide travels relative to the actual pitch or number of threads per inch, of the thread itself, that's how we can actually get these uh, very accurate graduations, right? We're subdividing one full revolution into, you know, in this case, I think 200,000, sorry, 200 different parts. Each one is worth a thousandth of an inch, 
right, because of the specific type of thread that's in here. Well, that's all fine and dandy. The only problem is that these two components, the nut and the screw, have to move relative to each other, which means, of course, that there has to be a little bit of clearance in between the two uh, features, right? And that means that there's a little bit of slop in the mechanism. This one's actually pretty tight, but you can kind of see that there's a little bit of wiggle in between the nut and the screw. So what this means is that if you go forward, right, and the nut is loaded in a particular direction, it's going to touch one side of the threads. But if you back it up, then it's going to be loaded in the other direction. It's going to touch the other side of the threads. But in between that that change in direction where the nut gets loaded to another side of the threads, there's going to be a little bit of sort of dead space during the transition. And that dead space is known as backlash. Basically, where you're turning the screw, but the nut's not necessarily moving. Okay? We have the same problem here with the cross slide, where actually there's a little bit of dead space in here where I can rotate the dial, but the cross slide's not actually moving. We're just shifting around inside of the backlash. Let me explain. Okay, so I'm going to try and do this in like the absolute simplest terms. I know how to. I just grabbed one of these little indicators. It's the same type of indicator that we've been using so far. It's just mounted onto this little magnetic base. And I'm going to set it up on the end of the tool post here so that I can measure movement. Right? When I turn the dial, it should also move this piece. So I'm actually just going to go ahead and zero out the dial right here. So this is at zero, and I'm going to zero this out as well. I'm going to just readjust that so it's in a more logical location. Okay. Zero that out. Okay. Now, if I move the dial forward, you can see that the indicator also moves. Okay, that makes sense. Now, what happens if I reverse the dial? Will the indicator also move? Let's see. So, no. Until I get past a certain point, and then it starts to move. But that was already like, let's see, how much backlash was that actually? That was all, like 35 to 40 thousandths on the dial before this started registering movement. That's actually a lot of backlash. And these older machines do tend to have a lot of backlash. So that's not a problem. It's not like you can't make good parts with this machine. You just have to make sure that you always account for the backlash. So the way that you account for the backlash is like, you know, let's take our previous example here. We were, where were we here? So we had taken a cut at 20 thousandths, okay? So that's where we are. Uh, and then I went forward 65 thousandths. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 5. So that's 20 thousandths plus 65 thousandths. I'm at 85 thousandths, 0 0.085 right now. But I accidentally overshot a little bit. I can't just move back that 5 thousandths. I have to back it up, let's say, one full revolution and then go back into my number in the same way and just make sure that I stop at the right place this time. That's all that you need to do. You just always need to make sure that you're loading the nut in the same direction to take out the backlash. I hope that that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, you can leave a comment on the Canvas page. All right, let's go ahead and take this cut. Enough talking. So this is going to be our sort of final roughing cut. In machining, there are always roughing cuts and finishing cuts. And for roughing, we're really just trying to remove material as absolutely quickly as possible to get a more or less rough shape. And then and only then, back this off one full revolution, and then and only then do we actually slow things down and try to accomplish a better finish, okay? And you'll see why in a moment. But really here, we're just worried about productivity, material removal rate, and then we're going to slow down and concentrate on dimensions and surface finishes. So now we're close enough that I'm actually going to use a micrometer. 
Remember, the tolerance is plus or minus five thousandths because this is a three-place decimal um, uh, dimension. Let's see. Always make sure that you zero set these. I always use the ratchet stop because it's, it always puts exactly the same amount of force on there. That did not seem to clean it off very well. So one of my little tricks is just to use a piece of paper, just kind of close the faces down on a piece of paper like that, and then pull it out. And that usually cleans it off pretty well. Let's see. Yeah, so there, now it's reading perfectly right there. So there's just a little bit of schmoo in between the faces, and that's why it was off. Okay, I'm going to back this out now, and I'm going to measure the surface. Again, when I'm measuring with the micrometer, what I'm really looking for is uh, that I need to make sure that I'm not cocked out, like in this direction, not cocked out like that. And I also need to make sure that I'm in the correct position, uh, well, now it's uh, towards and away from the camera, making sure that I'm directly on the uh, largest part of the diameter, truly measuring across the diameter. So what I just do is I just go in, I rock it back and forth this way, I rock it back and forth left to right, make it, making sure that I've got a good measurement, hit the ratchet stop, lock it down so that when I remove it, it doesn't spin and change my measurement, and now I can read that. And that looks an awful lot like 900, so the bevel on the end of the spindle here, or sorry, at the end of the, uh, this, um, the thimble, is right past that nine, that big nine mark. So we know that we have 900 thousandths, but we're not quite at the next mark, so we're not at 925. So that's 908 thousandths, plus a little change. I'm not gonna worry about the vernier scale, okay? We don't need to get down to tenths of a thousandth of an inch here. 908. So if I'm at 908, and I wanna get down to 875, then that means I need to take how much? Sometimes I get lost and I just need to do this with a calculator. So 908 thousandths minus 875, that's 33 thousandths of an inch. And let's say we take that in two cuts, okay? I usually do two finish cuts um, at exactly the same settings, right? So I take a second to last cut with all the same settings as the final cut, and then I take a final measurement and then whatever that tells me to take, that's how much I take. Because I could be pretty sure that I can measure that or I can trust that measurement because it was made with exactly the same settings as the final cut. That's the, that's the idea there, okay? So let's say we'll take a cut of, let's just say 15 thousandths because it's a nice uh, simple number. It'll line up with our dials really nicely. Then we'll take another measurement and see where we are. Okay. Okay. Go back in my one full revolution, and then I'm going to go another 5, 10, 15, and uh, take a cut. Oh, actually, I'm going to go ahead and slow the feed rate down a little bit. So we were at 7 thousandths. Now I'm going to slow it down to 3 thousandths per revolution. Okay. So reading it here on the side, it says LCT4W for 3 thousandths per rev. So L, C, T, 4, and W. Give it a little coolant and feed. Now you can immediately see that this is a much, much slower cut. So the reason why we don't do this from the beginning is that it just takes a lot of time. And when you're roughing, what does it matter what the surface finish looks like? Because you're about to cut off all that surface anyway. So don't even bother with it. But let me actually go ahead and stop this right now so that I can show you what it looks like. And clean that off so you can get a good, good image of what it looks like. You'll be able to really clearly see how big of a difference it makes how fast you feed this thing. I don't know how helpful that is. Um, but this is a significantly better finish than this is. This is, it's torn a little bit, and it's just much more serrated uh, as opposed to this surface, which is, I mean, just visually shinier, but also it's much, much smoother.
Okay, so that's quite a nice finish. And we could get a little bit better too. I think that this tool probably needs to get uh, reground and restoned. Uh, you know, over time it will wear. Uh, and you can tell, like, if you're trying to, you know, you're taking a finishing cut and it looks more like this than this, uh, then you know that it's about time to resharpen that tool. But this, this looks perfectly acceptable. So I'm going to call it good. Okay, let's go ahead and start this thing back up. And I'll complete the cut. This is what I really like about this leaded steel. It just machines beautifully. You know, uh, regular low carbon steel, it, it likes to tear rather than cut cleanly. But this stuff is just perfect. Great for your first project, okay? So on the final cut, I actually don't back it off because there's just a tiny little bit of inaccuracy that is introduced uh, whenever you back off one revolution then go back in with the dial. So I'm just gonna leave it where it is right now. Clean it up, take a final measurement, and then whatever the micrometer tells me, that's how much I'm gonna take. All right, here we go, knock it back and forth. All right, so what does it say? It says, so it's the, the bevel on the end of the thimble there is, let's see, 800, 25, 50, 75, but not quite to the 900. So 875 plus 19. So that means that I've got 19 thousandths to go to get down to 875. All right, that's how much I'm gonna take. Let's do it. Turn it on. Go in from where I am right now, go in 19 thousandths. So that's 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. It can be kind of hard to see those small graduations, but do your best. Now we're gonna take a cut. Looking pretty good. Nothing really fun and exciting happened during this demonstration. Sometimes things go inexplicably wrong and I get a, let's say a fun opportunity to share mistakes with people. They are actually really good learning opportunities. They're just kind of irritating. But that's life, you know? That's life as a machinist. I often tell people that one of the things you just have to accept as a, as a machinist is that uh, you're gonna fail because there are so many variables involved in this stuff that there's no way you're ever gonna be able to account for all of them. And sometimes things just kind of go wrong, you know? So uh, a major soft skill, let's say, that you've got to have as a machinist is being able to accept failure without internalizing it, if that makes any sense. I'm gonna go ahead and measure this right here because just in case I'm really far off with my measurement, or with my cut, rather, uh, then I haven't moved it yet, right? So it's very easy to just take another cut of whatever size it needs to be. But so that is telling me that I am at eight, 825, 50, 75, and one, just under 876 thousandths. So tolerance is plus or minus five thousandths, and I'm less than one thousandths off of the target, so I'm good. I'm gonna go ahead and back this off, move it out of the way. And um, one thing that I'm going to do uh, is that there, there's a little bit of a, it doesn't really feel like there's much of a burr there, but there's a pretty sharp edge. And even if there's not a burr, this can get sort of damaged pretty easily. Um, so I'm going to just break that edge with a file just in order to clean it up. Okay, just going to use this file right here. Nothing special. Going to go ahead and 
Set this to a very, very low speed. Filing on the lathe is done at a very low speed. Something like that. That's just 70 RPM, the slowest it'll go. Okay, now I always stand off to the right side of the file. You really make sure that the file's got a handle on it, right? Because if it's just the tang, this can easily get kicked out and become a projectile, right? So go ahead and cock this out at 45 degrees. And we're not just going to let it sit there rubbing on the same part of the file the whole time. We're actually going to stroke it forward, remembering that a file only cuts on the forward stroke. You can be pretty gentle with this. I mean, it does, it's not going to require a whole lot. That's already good enough. Beautiful. Okay, let's take this thing out. So there it is. Okay, we've got faced, faced to the correct size, center center, and this is turned. So now all we have to do is uh, mount it between centers with this side on the left, and then we're going to machine the two other diameters here. But that's going to be in the next video. Okay? Thanks.